Amen. Well, I invite you guys to take your Bibles and turn with me for our scripture reading for our sermon this morning. We are going to be in the Old Testament, and we're going to look together at Psalm 49. Psalm 49, we're going to look together at the whole psalm this morning. But for our reading, I'm just going to read the last few verses. So we'll read together Psalm 49, and I'll read verses 16 through 20. I invite you to please stand with me for the reading of Holy Scripture. Psalm 49, 16 to 20. This is the Word of God for us His people, and this is the majestic voice of of the Lord for us. God's Word says, <clears throat> Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For although while he lives, he counts himself blessed, and though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. This is God's holy word for us as people. Let's ask him to bless our time in his word today. Father, we commit these next few moments to your voice and your spirit to speak. You've heard us speak to you in prayer and in song. We ask now, Lord, that you would help us to be still and know that you are God and to give us ears to hear, for you to speak to us and for you to write your truth from your word upon our hearts today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Life is full of puzzling things. Unresolved riddles are all around us, if you're paying attention. So let me just give you a few. Riddle number one. Why is the word phonetic not pronounced the way it's spelled? <laughs> Why is there not another word for synonym Here's a classic. If a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? What is the sound of one hand clapping? Here's one. If a man is speaking in the woods and there's no woman around to hear him, is he still wrong? Or riddle me this, why are there interstate highways in Hawaii? <laughs> Most puzzling of all, and this is absolutely true, I know this from personal experience from four years at college and in, at Liberty University. In Lynchburg, Virginia, there is a stretch of highway where you are driving on U.S. 29 South and U.S. 501 North at the same time. <laughs> Not making it up? Go there. And you will see the signs literally say, the road signs literally say, you are going north and south at the exact same time. How, that, how does that make any sense? Who did that? I think it's the seam in the space-time continuum. I think that's where the edge of the universe is. Because when you drive there, your clock, your watch stops ticking. And your GPS starts smoking. And the Maps app on your phone glitches. And it's the edge of the universe. It makes no sense. But go there. See it for yourself. These are just some of the sort of humorous riddles of life that don't really need an answer. 
But there are other riddles that are more serious and that we would love to figure out. There are lots of these, but let's just pick one for today. I've heard my dad ask this question before. Why do the most generous people never have much to give, but the most greedy and selfish people seem to have everything? Some of the nicest, most generous, selfless, giving people that I've known personally have lived most of their life with a whole lot of nothing. That they just had more. They wanted, they wanted to give and do and help, but they just never seemed to have enough, barely enough for themselves and not much to give to other people. And yet there are people all over the place who are greedy, self-interested, selfish, and yet they're so successful, they're, they prosper, they flourish, they seem to have a lot of stuff with no interest in giving it away or helping other people. It's a riddle. In biblical terms, we would ask it this way, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? This is a question the Bible is routinely bothered by. For example, Ecclesiastes 7.15, In my vain life I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. You feel that? Ecclesiastes 8.14, there is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said this also is vanity. You hear this also not just in Ecclesiastes, But you hear it also in the words of the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 12, verse 1, he ends that verse by saying, he's talking to God. He says in his prayer, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? This is a problem that the Bible comes back to over and over. One more passage, this time back in the Psalms. Psalm 73, verses 3 to 5, the psalmist complains. He says, I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Envious, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. And he goes on in verse 12, he says, Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease, They increase in riches. And then he says, All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. You hear the psalmist's problem there? He's saying, I'm watching these wicked people who don't give any thought to God, holiness, obedience, and they're prospering, they're thriving, they're doing great. And then I look at me and others like me, and we're trying to be righteous, we're trying to obey, we're trying to be holy and live for the Lord, and and we just seem to get rebuked every day, and we get smashed over and over again. Why is this? And then he says, I was envious of them. I almost thought... What's the point in even trying to serve the Lord? Clearly, <laughs> clearly, that's the way to go, the way they're going. They're the ones prospering, not the righteous. This is one of the big riddles of life. The great disparity we so often find, both in the biblical world and in our own, between the fortunes of the ungodly and the misfortunes of the godly. And we cry out to God with confusion and complaint like Jeremiah. Where is the God of justice? How can you allow this in your world, God? And like the psalmist of Psalm 73, we grow envious 
and fearful and even begin to question, what's the real value of living for the Lord after all if it just lands me in this spot? And the ones who don't live for the Lord seem to be doing well. We grow envious and fearful in the face of this perplexing riddle of life. In our passage this morning, the psalmist sings a song of joy and relief, for he tells us that he has solved the riddle, and he wants to share it with the whole world. Look with me at verses 1 through 4. The psalm begins this way, hear this, all peoples, Give ear, all inhabitants of the world. He is standing on a mountain. He is shouting from the rooftops. Everybody on earth, listen, I finally cracked the code. I have solved the riddle. I figured it out. Verse 2, both low and high, rich and poor together. Meaning the godly and the ungodly, the rich, the poor, everybody. Listen. Verse 3, my mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. If you listen to me, you're going to be wise. You're going to have the understanding that you need. You're going to have the insight into this riddle. Verse 4, I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. So these psalms are songs, literally songs, and they're musical instruments, and they're written, it's Hebrew poetry and lyric, and it's set to music. So this is something that the ancient Israelites would sing together. This was part of the hymn book of ancient Israel, the book of Psalms. And so this is part of their song. And so it's rich with imagery and poetic pictures. And so let's move into this passage and see what he has for us. What he does next is he, he doesn't say the riddle the way I've stated it. He actually turns it around and he says in this in verses 5 and 6. This is the controlling question for the whole thing. Why should I fear in times of trouble, verse 5, when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches? Why should I be fearful? Why should I fret? Why should I be envious or upset when I'm in the midst of trouble and the wicked are doing awesome? See how he's turned it around? Not, how's this happening, God, but why should I be upset by this? Why should I be worried? And his answer is in the rest of the psalm, because he solved the riddle. So the rest of the psalm is his answer to this question, verses 5 and 6. And so I've taken the rest of the psalm, and I've broken his answer down into three parts. And we're going to look at those one at a time together. These are three reasons why we should not fear or be distressed by the riddle of life when the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. Three reasons. Reason one. Reason one is this. It's because we should not fear because the wicked may have riches, but they have no ransom. They may have their riches, but they have no ransom. Let's look at how he explains this. He says in verse 6, in verse 6 he describes the prosperous, wicked, this way. He says they are those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches. And then he says in verses 7 to 9, truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. So they have their riches, but he says they do not have a ransom. What does he mean? He says here that there is no amount of wealth, no amount of riches, prosperity, that could ever be enough to pay the price for eternal life. See that at the end of verse 8 and verse 9? The ransom of their life is costly. It can never suffice. They can never pay it that they should live on forever and never see the pit. 
The idea here is this picture of death pictured as someone who is holding their life hostage. Someone who's demanding a ransom. What's the ransom price? It's unpayable. It's utterly unpayable. It's far too high to pay for any human being. There's nothing that we could pay, no amount of prosperity, no amount of wealth, accumulation, possessions, stuff, nothing that we could amass in this life that we could then trade in for a get-out-of-the-grave free card. But all, he says, will go down to the pit. The pit is the hole in the ground with your name on it. It's the grave. There's nothing you can pay to get out of it. So the wicked, they're doing fine in life. They have all this stuff, all this prosperity. And yet, when the day of reckoning comes, it's valueless. It's less than useless. They can't trade it in for an extension on their life. And then it says, in verse 7, truly no man can ransom another, so you can't pay for your friend or give to God the price of his life. You can't bribe God with your stuff. You can't show him the bank account and the bank statement and the cars and the houses and the reputation and the wealth and the status and the influence and the prestige and the honor and the connections and the importance. You can't show him God all that stuff and say, can we trade? I'll turn it in for more life, because no doubt with that extra life, we're just going to try and accumulate the stuff again, and we're just going to keep wishing for more wishes. <laughs> we're just going to keep trying to play this game. And God says, you can't play this game. You, there's no amount you can pay. The ransom of your life isn't payable. The wealth of the wicked is less than useless in the face of death and valueless in the grave. He goes on in verses 10 to 12, and he says, For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. Right? They, they had their property, they put their name all over their property, but that property they can't keep. That's the property they get buried in. Verse 12, man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. Sobering words for the wicked. This is the first reason why the righteous shouldn't be upset, shouldn't fret, over the prosperity of the wicked because it's short-lived. It has an expiration date. And when that expiration date comes, all that prosperity and all that flourishing comes to an end. It doesn't last forever. So this disparity will not be permanent. It will not continue like this forever. But there's a day coming when all of that fortune and wealth, possessions and stuff, will come crumbling down and the person in the grave is left with nothing. The wicked can't take it with them. So don't be upset. They're not going to be like that for long. Why should I worry? Why should I fear? They cannot use all that wealth to ransom their life from death and the grave. That's reason number one. You comfort yourself with the thought that God has an expiration date to the thriving and prosperity of the wicked. Reason number two. The first reason is the wicked have riches but no ransom. But the second reason is that the we, the righteous, do have a ransom even without riches. We do have a ransom regardless of whether we have riches or not. So this is the next section, verses 13 to 15. He begins verse 13 by continuing to speak about the fate of the wicked. He says, this is the path 
of those who have foolish confidence, confidence in their riches. Yet after them, people approve of their boasts. People don't learn the lesson. People don't learn the lesson. They have foolish confidence, and yet after them, people keep doing the same things, approving of the boasts that they have, the confidence that they place. And yet, verse 14 says, like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. But, verse 15, but God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. This is one of the most exquisite sections of this psalm in terms of the imagery and the poetry. So we need to break this down a little bit. He talks here about, in verses 13 and 14, he talks about Sheol. So let's take a second and ask, what is Sheol? Now here, it's not translated, at least in the ESV. If your Bible says Sheol, that's just a, they took a, Hebrew word and switch those Hebrew letters into English letters and just stuck it in there. Sheol is just Hebrew. It's not a translation. If you have another translation besides the ESV or something like that, it might actually give you what the word means. But Sheol to the Hebrew imagination, to the Hebrew idea of how the God had built the cosmos, Sheol is the underworld. It's the underworld. See, for, for the Hebrew mind... We're not on a planet, right? That's a modern idea that you're on a planet right now. <laughs> a rock in space fly, flying about a solar system. They had no concept of that. For them, the heavens and the earth just meant the ground, mountains, and the, and the lakes and the, and the oceans like the earth with the water, and then the air in between the ground and the sky, Clouds, sun, moon, and stars, the water that's up there that rains down. And that's the universe. That's the world. That's the cosmos. Right? There's no idea of, they didn't, there's no idea of like the earth is a planet floating in the center of the solar system with the sun going around it. It was just the idea of the sun is in a dome that circles the earth, but the earth's not a planet. It's just what there is. Right? So we don't, this isn't our imagination today because we have modern science. And this is how they pictured it. Now, where is heaven? Not the heavens, like where the birds and the stars and stuff are, but heaven, where God is, that's the chamber that sits up on top of our heavens. It's the land, the place, the chamber where God and angels and the throne of heaven, that's where God is. He's up there. Sheol is sort of this bottom cavity this cavernous place down in the basement of the cosmos. God's up on the top, and then there's this underworld. And it wasn't like where the devil lives. That's medieval stuff. It wasn't anything like that. It's just the place of the dead. It's where people go when they die, down into Sheol. This is how they pictured it in their cosmology. Sheol is the underworld. Sometimes it's called the netherworld. It's the place where... People go when they die, and it's located way down, physically down, underneath the earth. That's what Sheol is in the Hebrew cosmos. Now, it says this here in verse 14. It says, the end of verse 14, talking about the wicked, their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. Their form shall. And this is a word, it's not used that much in the Old Testament. It's used once in Isaiah for idols because it means shape or sometimes an image. It's your shape. You see, the Hebrews, they didn't, have a, they didn't really have a word for that part of you that lives forever. That language, that vocabulary develops later. And here, in their imagination, it's very material, it's very concrete. When a person, if you've, ever, if you've ever been in a hospital room or a hospice room, and you've seen someone 
in the death process and you're there with them as they pass away. I've been in a room like that before. And there's a, at early on in that process, you can, the person, it just looks like they're sleeping. They're just sort of sitting, laying there and they look like they might be asleep. But as the, as the stats on the monitor get lower and lower and lower, and the heartbeat dies down, and the brain activity minimizes, and the body's shutting down. I, I, my memory of this is like, it just looked like the person kind of went flat. Like they just didn't look like they were asleep anymore. They just, the body just flattened out almost, is the way I remember it. I don't know how it is every time. But it was just clear that like, Whoever that was that was in there isn't in there anymore. Like, that, they're gone at that point. And the Hebrews were much more acquainted with death than we are. They were up close and people died at home. And everybody saw it. And mortality rates were much higher. It's the ancient world. There's no medicine or there's rudimentary medicine. So they're very close to death in a way that we aren't. We're sort of insulated from it most of the time, unless we work in a profession that puts us in contact with it. But we don't see it that much. They saw it a lot. And so they had this idea that what, what is that when the person just kind of goes flat or you just, they just kind of don't look like anything anymore? And it's clear we've crossed over from person who's asleep to, to a deceased person, to a corpse. What they thought was their form goes down to Sheol, right? The body stays right there and you bury it. But the form, it's, it's like the, our idea of the soul. I guess the best way to describe it is if, you, if you've ever seen a snake skin, you find a, a big long snake skin, it's just white right? And it's, it's really thin and light, and you can almost see through it if you hold it up. You can kind of see light coming through it. And they've, they've shed that skin. Their idea was you sort of shed your soul. It just kind of sloughs off as you die. And it's super thin. Incre you can't see it, right? You just watch the person changing, but you don't see the soul coming off of them. But the idea is their soul sort of sloughs off, and it's, and it's still material in some way, but it's super thin and incredibly light. And Sheol has this kind of gravity, and it's so light that it just sort of, if you've seen like a feather floating down in the, from a, in the air, and it just kind of does this. It's almost like the soul just sort of drifts and floats through the earth down into Sheol. There's this sort of pull that pulls it down. And that's what this is getting at. Their form, their shape, whatever it is that they are, something like their soul, it goes down into Sheol. This is the idea they have. The body sloughs off the soul which descends down into Sheol. And here's where the poetry picks back up. It says... Like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd. And so it's like when the, when the form, when the soul sloughs off the body, sloughs off of the body, it's like death is like a shepherd who just goes around and all the people who were dying at that time, he's rounding them up. He gathers them into his little flock and he leads them down, down, down into Sheol. And it says that, their form shall be consumed in Sheol. Now Sheol is not pictured as a place. It's pictured as this thing with jaws and an appetite that eats. And death shepherds these souls down into the underworld and it consumes them. It gobbles them up. It eats them. And that's where they stay. Think of Jonah in the belly of the fish. This is, the, this, is this great monster that gobbles up people and keeps them there. Locked inside forever. This is, this is poetry. This is music. This is rich imagery. A shepherd leading his sheep to be eaten. That's what he is saying happens to the wicked. This is what he's saying happens to everybody who dies. The difference is the wicked stay there, but not the righteous. You see, they don't have a ransom to escape the jaws of Sheol 
to get their soul out, to spare them. They can't pay death. They can't pay off Sheol. They can't pay off the grave. They can't bribe God. They have nothing, no ransom at all. But here in verse 15, we get Old Testament gospel. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. God will pay the ransom price for his people. So you don't have to worry about not having wealth and material things and riches and prosperity in life because you don't need them. <laughs> now, we all would like to be comfortable and cozy and have convenience. That's, 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 that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, look, the wicked, it doesn't serve them any good forever to have all the wealth. It doesn't do them any good. And it won't do you any extra good to have it because before God, it doesn't matter. What matters is you belong to him. He receives you. Do you belong to him? Then this life is a temporary imbalance of some wicked who prosper and some righteous who don't. But the day is coming when that's going to be absolutely reversed. And their souls are locked away. Their souls will perish, what the New Testament calls the second death. But the good news is God is the one who ransoms our lives. Verse 7, truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life for the ransom for their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. And yet God will pay the ransom. This is where we see the New Testament come into the picture because in Christ, God has provided the one who pays the ransom price. The one who gave his life into the jaws of Sheol itself. The good shepherd encounters the shepherd of death in Psalm 49. But he goes down and he bursts open the jaws of Sheol. And he ransacks the underworld itself. And he brings out his righteous ones, his holy ones, and brings them to heaven. And he's the one who explodes the power of the grave and bursts it open. And because he paid the ransom price, your soul will go free. The good shepherd defeated the death shepherd. Jesus conquered the power of Sheol. God in his love and grace provided the perfect ransom for his people. This is the way... Uh, the book of the prophet Hosea says in chapter 13, verse 14. He says, speaking of his own people, I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall redeem them from death. O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Glorious words that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 15 and applies them to us, that God will raise us up with Christ from death itself. It does not have the last word. It's the, it's the eternal home for the wicked, but not for the righteous. Do not fear when you are in trouble and you see the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer because their time ends and your time will be forever. That's reason number two that we should not fear in the face of this riddle of life. Last reason this morning. Number one, the wicked have riches but no ransom. Number two, the righteous have a ransom without riches. But number three, the final reason not to fear is because the glory of the wicked will fade forever and the light of the righteous will dawn. And this is where we read our passage at the beginning of the sermon. In verses 16 and 17, he talks about the glory of the wicked. He says, be not afraid. This is his conclusion. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him, down to Sheol. Right? That's the idea of descending. 
Now, it's, this poetry here is beautiful because the reason the form, the, the, the soul that sloughs off of the body can, can float down is because it's so light and thin. In Hebrew, the word for glory means weight. It means heavy. Your glory is your weightiness, your importance, or the mass of wealth that you've accumulated, your glory in this sense. And here, the reason the wicked can't take their glory with them is because it's too heavy. It won't go down with them. The soul goes down, but the stuff we collect in life just sits there on the ground. It, it can't get down there with us. Beautiful poetry. Our stuff's too heavy to take with us. We can't carry it. We go down alone. We come into the world empty, and we go out empty. What makes the difference is if we are in the hands of God. Do we belong to Him? Have we trusted in the ransom that He has provided for us? Do we look to Christ who conquered death and hell and the grave? He says in verse 18, for though while he lives, he counts himself blessed. And though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers, that's Sheol, who will never again see light. They will never see light. And that's in contrast to one little detail I skipped over earlier in verse 14, where it says, like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. They will never see light. The day of death is the day the light ceases and their glory fades for them. They have no ransom. But for us, for the righteous, those who belong to Christ, those who trust in the gospel, who belong to God, we are the upright of verse 14, and we will rule over them in the morning. What happens in the morning? The light dawns, and the morning is the, is the time you get up. You see, they go to their graves and do not rise and never again see the light. We have a morning dawn coming when the light will shine and we will rise and the righteous will rule over the wicked forever in the day of resurrection in a new heavens and a new earth all because of the ransom paid by the Lord Jesus Christ the ransom provided by the love and grace of God himself for us without money and without price. He will not charge you a fee for this ransom. He pays it out of his own riches for you. And Christ lays down his life to conquer all of our enemies, including the last enemy, which is death. The dawning light of resurrection is coming. And in that day, Psalm 52 will come to pass. God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent, speaking to the wicked. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. The righteous will have the last laugh. So do not fear, Christian, when you see the great disparity in this world between those who don't live for the Lord, who seem to have things going in their favor, who seem to be thriving, and you see good, godly, generous Christian people just being stomped and marginalized and forgotten and suffer and have a whole lot of nothing. Don't be grieved. Do not be upset. Even if it's you in the midst of the struggle, do not fear because the great reversal has been promised and decreed. And one day you will see the victory of the righteous and the justice served to the wicked. 
So be faithful right where you are. Continue trusting in the Lord, walking with Him. Do not think, oh, well, I might as well just give up trying to be godly because look where it gets me. No. Where it's going to get you is shining like the sun forever in the kingdom of your heavenly Father. And you will see the victory God has promised through Christ. I'll end with the words of Psalm 37. It says, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as at the noonday. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Let's pray. Father, we give you glory today and we thank you first and foremost because you have paid our ransom price for us. You have paid the highest price, the ultimate price, so that we can go free from our bondage and our fear. We can go free from our unholiness and our sin. We can go free from the threat and dread of death. We can go free from the dread and gloom of a tomb. We can emerge from our own bondage and fear at the swirling injustice around us, at the seeming disparities between those who are faithful to you and yet suffer and those who are far from you and yet flourish. Protect us from looking at the way you run your world here in this fallen time and thinking that you're not wise or you've made some kind of mistake or surely there's injustice with God. May it never be. But strengthen us and encourage us from your word and help us to look at Christ perfectly righteous yet who suffered even death on a cross, who despised the shame and for the joy set before him endured it all for our sake. Lord, help us to put our trust in that great ransom price you paid for us. Lord, help us today to realize that we can come to you through Christ, that we can come to you. Oh, Jesus, we come to you today. We come to you out of our fear. We come to you out of our sin. We come to you out of our confusion. And we pray one day and trust through your shed blood for us that we will come forth even from the grave to dwell with you on high forever. Give us that faith and strengthen us with that promise, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.